What's up, skeptics? Welcome to another episode of Reason to Doubt, your source for all things skeptical. I'm Jordan, joined with Jared, and today we have the world's most metal biblical scholar, Dr. Kip Davis. How's it going, Kip? <laughs> it's good. I uh, I have some Finnish friends who might get upset if they watch this. <laughs> <laughs> So, well, uh, are... if, they'd, if they'd like to submit evidence that they are, in fact, more metal than more you metal. are, <laughs> we're skeptics, we're always willing to change our mind, you know. <laughs> uh, I, I, live for, uh, I live for three months. I have a very good friend at the University of Helsinki by the name of uh, Mika Payunen, um, and he and I lived together for, I don't know, I think it was like four months. Uh, he was staying at my place while he was working at the University of Aachen. And that's, I mean, that's most of just what we did in the evenings was just blew our brains out with uh, with uh, uh, Scandinavian death metal. It was, it was a good time. Awesome. <laughs> it's a good time. And, and he actually introduced me to one of my all-time uh, favorite metal bands, which is, uh, which is Amorphous, a uh, good Finnish metal band that actually sings in English, which can be rare. Cool. Sorry, That's, guys. Can, we'll have, you know, we'll have to or, do some here. homework. And... You have some uh, Finnish metal to go into. I know you've been digging through your catalog. Yeah, I'll have to check into that. So, <laughs> For I those who don't on. know, uh, Dr. Kip is a biblical scholar. He's an expert in the Dead Sea Scrolls, among other things. Uh, Kip, what do you have going on in your channel coming up? Uh, well, I've been, I've been spending a lot of time focusing on actually uh, getting some writing done. I just recently, uh, but, but I, I have some video projects in the works. I guess it was uh, last week I published a video about um, child sacrifice in, uh, in, the, in the Old Testament, but more specifically, uh, child sacrifice as it pertains to Christian theology. And this was in response to uh, some pretty silly comments that were made by um, an apologist by the name of Tim Barnett on, uh, on a Sean McDowell uh, interview so there's that um on sunday we just debuted our inaugural episode of the diablo critics uh with my good friends uh the amazing uh dr jennifer bird uh dr joshua bowen dr dan mcclellan dr matt monger well, that's and a real myself. heavyweight panel there yeah it was a great panel i recommend it oh, so. you know i i went back and i watched it uh like after like yesterday i guess i i actually took some time and, and sat down and watched uh bits of it and i have to say like maybe i'm a little biased but i i thought it was a good panel too. it was great <laughs> yeah so, well that's and it's that's some great ahead. that that's a great panel you put together that's the team of rock stars right there so the 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 awesome thing about this is we're doing this every month uh on my channel Every Sunday, or sorry, no, I shouldn't say every Sunday. <laughs> this <laughs> I'll get myself into trouble. Yeah. Uh, the second Sunday of every month uh, on my channel at eleven o'clock Pacific, uh, we're going to uh, we're going to do this. Uh, we've carved out a two hour window to do um, a live uh, Q and A in which we also take some time to address uh, current ongoing. Uh, apologetic pseudo historical pseudo biblical critical nonsense so it's fun it you managed cool. to find a fun two-hour fun. window every month yeah. with six people if that's not proof <laughs> of god i don't know what is it i think it's a testament to how much everybody wanted to do it and the crazy thing about it too it's not just carving out a two-hour window once a month it's carving out a two-hour window that fits with everybody's mm -hmm. uh, schedules when you're like spread across countries, like yeah, eighteen time zones. <laughs> so that's incredible. Like Matt Monger, my friend in Oslo, starts at like eight o'clock p.m. on uh, on Sunday night, and uh, David McDonald from uh, Deep Drinks Podcast, who's helping me to uh, produce it and and to moderate the chat and stuff. He's getting up at five in the morning on Monday just to be there. <laughs> Nuts, no, that's eh? that's, that's early. That's dedication. <laughs> yeah. So it's 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 tremendous dedication. And I couldn't I couldn't be happier. It was a it was an awesome inaugural uh, inaugural episode. 
so but that's 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 what I've been that's what I've been up to recently. So yeah, there's that and, and the book and yeah. Very exciting. So once you guys are done here, Kip's links are in the description. Make sure you go over, hit the subscribe and hit the little bell so that you don't get fooled by the algorithm. So you make sure you get that every month. Um so uh, I'll mention one more thing, and it's because you you actually asked, and I uh, I neglected to get back to you. So I actually I have a course um, mm. on MVP courses called Real Israelite Religions, Facts on the Ground, and Propaganda in the Bible. It's 13 hours long. It's 18 lectures. I think it costs like 40 or 50 bucks. I think it's 50 bucks. Um, but uh, the it's it's all 4K high def. Um, the uh, it is an actual uh, university course that I taught. It's a second year university course all about uh, the religious background of uh, the Old Testament text and the relation to the texts and uh, an exploration of the material culture, the, the, the uh, findings in archaeology and how those fit within the, uh, the texts of the Hebrew Bible. Um, and that's actually where the, that's where the book is coming from too. I decided to turn the course into a book. So I've, it's given me a chance to rewrite a bunch of this stuff. Um, so yeah, please uh, check out the course and also that, look for the book when it comes out. That link is also in the description. Nice. Uh, so make sure to check that out. Speaking of the foundations of, <laughs> of Judaism, today we are going to be talking about polytheism and how it relates to the Bible and uh, the religion that we now know as Christianity. Uh, if you read the Bible and listen to some young earth creationists, then uh, the Hebrew tradition spawned whole cloth at the foundation of the earth uh, and then went un in an unbroken line from there. But unfortunately, actual history tells us a different story. Um, I have a different story. So today we're going to be talking about the uh, signs of polytheism in that are still remnant in the Bible, what came before the recorded history of the Bible, and what kind of effects it would have had going forward. Uh, before we get into that, Discovering Ancient History with Pat Lowinger says, are we going to talk about cannabis? Are we? I, I <laughs> no, believe that was... we're not. <laughs> we're not. Um, because as uh, pa Pat's, uh, uh, th this is this is a bit of an inside joke. There was a guy that was just on um, <laughs> uh, Skeptic Haven, uh, talking about uh, about cannabis in the Bible. And um, if if it's there, I don't know. There's no way to really demonstrate that. So, whoopee. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the super chat. So let's dive right in, Kip. Uh, why don't you tell us about like what what was the context like, the historical context before the time of the Bible? So, um, and and this is going to this is probably going to to mess some people up a little bit in terms of of getting our chronology right even before the Bible can be a fairly imprecise term because uh, the Hebrew Bible, as we have it, I'm, I'm just going to ignore the new Testament because I'm, it's what I do and I'm good at it. So um, it, it, it's, uh, we're going to stick with the text of the old Testament or the Hebrew Bible. When it comes to the Hebrew Bible or the text of the old Testament, uh, people tend to have this picture of these, these uh, texts that were written um, you know, during the kingdoms of uh, Judah and Israel in the in the uh, early to mid Iron Age, and then collected together uh, at some point during or sh very shortly after the Babylonian exile, and ta-da, you have the Hebrew Bible. The picture is actually quite a bit more complex and quite a bit more nuanced uh, than that. And and some of your questions are delving into this this idea of how do we even understand and how do we even define what Judaism is and when do we start to de understand and and, and define. Uh, what we're talking about. The traditional view was always that we can we can start talking about uh, Judaism right in the Persian period. So that's like the fifth century, the the, the 400s to 500s uh, BCE with um, Ezra the priest and uh, Nehemiah, the uh, the Persian governor who came to uh, the land of Judah to uh, Jerusalem under the edict of, of Cyrus with the intention of rebuilding the temple. 
of Yahweh and with rebuilding the, uh, the, the city walls and refortifying the place. Uh, so traditionally, we, you know, it, it's assumed that that's where Judaism start. And from that point moving forward, we have this uniform body of literature we call the Torah. Um, and then, you know, the, the books of the prophets uh, and, and some of the other uh, literature from the Hebrew Bible was always collected along with these things through this, this unbroken chain of, of uh, uh, transmission stretching up to us today. Uh, the picture is much more nuanced and much more complex than that. One of the, um, uh, one of, uh, the books that, that I have used a fair bit in getting ready for today. And it's, I, I, I've told people it was the best book I read last year, uh, was Jonathan Adler's The Origins of Judaism, in which he takes, he, he is, he is an archeologist by training. And uh, he takes a, a very, uh, just, a, just a, a, a strict look at the material culture of the region of, uh, of Palestine in an effort to answer this question. Based on the archaeological record, when can we say that Judaism started? And he also has a very keen eye to the texts themselves and to the, the, the history uh, so he's able to to pose this question in terms of uh, of of the um, uh, the the celebration of of certain festivals, the recognition of the Sabbath, uh, the abstinence of pork, and importantly, the uh, the recognition of the Torah as normative for all of Judaism. And his surprisings are actually really. Uh, his, did I say his surprisings? <laughs> <laughs> you made a new word. His findings. <laughs> his findings. His yeah. surprising findings. His surprising. I don't even. I could just say his surprisings, and you guys. It, it works. Yeah. It works. So, um, so his findings are actually pretty surprising. What he discovers is that uh, prior to like the mid second century, the Hasmonean period, there's nothing that we can reliably attach uh, uh, to as Judaism as this this recognition of of the widespread usage of the Torah as normative in particular um, this appears to be something that that came out of uh, the the foundation of the Hasmonean kingdom which many historians will tell you is truly the only reliably uh, independent uh, kingdom of Israel or even Judah in all of history, in large part because we just don't know enough about what the kingdoms of Judah and Israel from the periods in which the Bible, the, the biblical text narrate, we just don't know enough about what they even looked like. We have ideas, and, but, you know. It's, and to uh, place that into not. history, like the Hasmonean period, that's like we're talking sec second temple period at this point. Um so yeah, this is second century. The uh, if if the story is to be believed, the second temple was constructed in 515 BCE. So the Hasmonean revolt occurred in 165. So you know this is That's 300 pretty recent, years. right? Yeah, yeah, very recent. So and and then again, like only a hundred and hundred and sixty years before before Jesus. Uh, so I think I think it's important, kind of getting getting that out of the way. Now, uh, the, while I tend to think that uh, the Hebrew Bible texts, uh, as we have them, are quite a bit later than, uh, than is often assumed, I think a lot of this stuff you can date pretty, pretty clearly to this same period of time, to the, the post-Babylonian period, to the post-Persian period even. Uh, that's not to say that many of the traditions within those texts are not much earlier. They are. There's lots of stuff in the text of the Hebrew Bible that looks like it did come out of uh, this earlier period, um, you know, from the time of, of around 900 BCE up to the destruction of Jerusalem in uh, 587 BCE. Some of this literature uh, probably traces back to that period. 
Um, and that's kind of what we're talking about when we talk about the so-called polytheistic roots of uh, ancient Israel. What the archaeology tells us, and and here again, this is this is something uh, that we do. We go to the archaeological record in an effort to establish what we're talking about um, in terms of of when these texts came from. So. William Foxwell Albright is is widely regarded as the father of so-called biblical archaeology. Uh, he was active in the the 1930s and the 1940s, and he he went into uh, Israel into Palestine, as the saying goes, with a Bible in one hand and a spade in the other, operating under the expectation that flip open my Bible to Joshua chapter uh, six. Uh, I should be able to follow these geographical directions, go and dig up Jericho and find and see exactly uh, what happened based on what the Bible tells me. Uh, so this is this was the approach in the early going. And what pretty quickly happened over, you know, a, a number of decades as this uh, as as uh, this stuff advanced uh, archaeologists started to discover that the picture uh, through the artifacts, the artifactual cultural, the material culture, actually looked pretty different from what the Bible actually says. So it, it, it forced archaeologists to force biblical scholars to go back and reevaluate what exactly is going on uh, with a lot of these check, with a lot of these yeah. uh, texts. As Here's said. an archaeologist in the room for us to... <laughs> to tell us about this stuff. You can't beat the physical evidence of history. Uh, but he does have a question for you. Uh, he asked, shouldn't we be careful how we use the term second temple as a new construction given all the sacking, defilement, and redaction that occurred between the sixth and first centuries? Yeah, um, certainly. But, uh, you know, because I am uh, limited by my audience and my subject to shorthand, I'm going to continue to use it just as a general term for whatever structure was there. Uh, in the uh, in the post Persian uh, period, he's so... speaking to the unwashed masses here. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Uh, and sometimes, like th this is this is part of the the problem with scholarship, right? Is is it's there's these complexities and and um, nuances uh, within the material that prevent us from from. I'd never get anywhere if I had to if I had to to you know carefully lay out and define everything that I'm I'm talking about in in broad strokes. Um, but Pat is absolutely right that um, in terms of of you know we also have this idea that that a temple was constructed in Jerusalem, um, maybe as early as as nine hundred or a thousand BCE, and it stood all the way up till the Babylonians destroyed it in 587, and then it was rebuilt in 515, and then it was renovated by Herod, uh, starting in, I believe, uh, around about uh, 30 or 40 BC, and, and it, it took decades uh, to complete it. Um, but the point Pat is making is that over the course of that time, the temple would have undergone whatever structure was there would have undergone such significant revisions, um, uh, revisions, uh, re, re, uh, renovations. <laughs> That's the word when we're talking about buildings, um, <laughs> would have undergone such significant renovations that in effect, uh, you're basically rebuilding the whole thing. Um, who knows how many times, uh, and this this typically happens after after any kind of invasion. We have we have mention in uh, the Deuteronomistic history in Second Kings of um, I'm going to get this wrong. Uh, one of the pharaohs actually coming into Jerusalem, and it says he he stole all the all the the shields and uh, he stole a bunch of stuff. He basically plundered uh, the temple. That might have been like a like a sacking like. That's something that that might have required extensive renovation that we just don't 
don't know about. And it's not like we can go dig there, right? Because it just happens to be the most sacred site in, you know, on the planet for yeah. for most people. So uh, we that let you take your for... Bible and spade and just get to town. <laughs> <laughs> don't they yeah. know who you so, are <laughs> uh no they do not uh <laughs> so that's just just by the way of background that's kind of what we're talking about um with it the picture we have within the bible is as you as you suggested uh that yahweh was the god of israel he was the only god of israel and uh, from the beginning of time it was always Yahweh and no one else. Uh, but that is not what we see in the archaeological record. And then after looking at the archaeological record and coming back to the text and reevaluating what you see in the text, you start to realize that's not even what we see in the text either. Um, in fact, my good friend and uh, one of my, my uh, co-hosts of uh, the Diablo Critics, uh, Dan McClellan, is hosting... A conference in May, uh, where basically the, the the topic will be how uh, inappropriate it is to talk about any of the biblical literature in the Old or the New Testament as monotheistic. Uh, polytheism is just seems to be uh, a fact of life for most people through the entire period, and we see. Uh, glimpses of this throughout the biblical texts. So when you're talking about that specifically, are you referring to things like when uh, there are contests with priests of other gods and those gods seem to have power, or when they're talking about angelic beings or something and those might be gods in some kind of sense? Is that the sort of thing you're getting at? Absolutely. So um, when I when I teach about this kind of stuff, as I do in my course, uh, you know, one of, one of the things that I will point out is that within a lot of the texts in the Bible, what we see is a picture of Yahweh who's in, in process of sort of assuming uh, control of this pantheon of deities. He's becoming the king of the gods, uh, in a manner of speaking. It's the same sort of thing that we see. There's a whole... Uh, a whole treasure trove of literature that was discovered at a site uh, quite a ways north of Jerusalem in uh, Syria called Ugarit. Uh, it, Ross Shamra is, is the modern name of it, but the ancient name of this settlement was Ugarit. And uh, these texts all date way back to like the 12th, 13th century, basically in that period leading right up to uh, the, the, the famous uh, great uh, international crisis. Uh, the catastrophe that that basically totally reshaped uh, the map of the Mediterranean um, in and around the 12th century BCE. Uh, so we have this library from Ugard, and it's very, very useful and interesting because what we see in these texts at uh, Ugarit is uh, reflections of a lot of the stuff that we find within the Bible, uh, but featuring some of the same characters, but also some different characters. In Ugarit, we see um, the the lower deity uh, Baal seemingly is is starting to us usurp the the old king of the gods, El. Uh, El is a god that we know from the Hebrew Bible. Uh, he's frequently just identified with Yahweh, and I think this is something that is taking place at a stage. In the development of the uh, the Israelite literature and and the religious traditions, but it it wasn't always that way, and we still see some hints and some pockets uh, within their texts of this development of uh, what was going on. And I think I mean sometimes it's just helpful to to look at some of these. So if I can get you guys to help me out, um, let's take a look at uh, let's start with Psalm eighty two. Um, this is a pretty interesting uh, text uh, that has given uh, certainly some modern commentators uh, pause at, for for reflection on figuring out what's going on. Um, it doesn't matter what uh, what version you're reading, but if one of you could maybe just read 
uh, it's short. It's only uh, eight verses, the entire psalm for me here. Go ahead. And I'll, I'll, I'll ask you to do something for me, though, Jared, is wherever you see uh, the word God with a capital G, if you can just replace that with L. I can do that. All right. All right. Psalm 82. L has taken his place in the divine council. I'm reading out of the NRSV updated edition, by the way. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. How long will you judge unjustly and shall partially to the, and show partially to the wicked Salah give justice to the weak and the orphan maintain the right of the lowly and the destitute rescue the weak and the needy deliver them from the land of the wicked. They have neither knowledge nor understanding. They walk around in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. I say, you are gods, children of the Most High, all of you. Nevertheless, you shall die like mortals and fall like any prince. Rise up, O El, judge the earth, for all the nations belong to you. So I think it's pretty clear that there's certainly more than one god present I mean, in this address in you are to have a divine <laughs> council of one you know <laughs> exactly exactly yeah. uh so the uh the, I, I'll, I'll just point out what one thing here where, where you read children of the most high this is literally the sons of elion elion mm-hmm. is a title that uh we we know elion as a title it's always attached to el within the ugaritic literature um, but this is a title that's 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 used frequently of uh, El there. It appears in a couple of places in the Hebrew Bible, um, and it appears to be used in the same way as a title for this this supreme uh, the supreme king of the gods, El. Um, and I think was there uh, was there one other thing I, I wanted to point out? I think I I think that's it. Um, evangelical. Uh, apologists often will tell you that uh, this is a this is an instance where where God is is excuse me addressing human judges and calling them gods, uh, mm. but that's silly. Let's just agree that that's silly. So um, it, it, it's on the face of it. I think this is a this is one of these sorts of texts which provides really clear indication that uh you know there is a pantheon of deities and what's happening here is l is passing judgment on them he's telling them you know you guys are you guys are fucking this up basically (laughs) i have to do everything myself uh let's look at psalm 91 and i think Uh, it's just oh yeah pat also mentions another verse and there's plenty we won't hit everyone but he mentions leviticus 16 yeah. where there are two gods mentioned there yahweh and uh azazel the god of the wild places he's kind of dividing up lots between the two of them i think was this the one i actually wanted to look at uh i might have got this wrong uh never mind let's uh let me look at my notes again here uh let's 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 go um instead to uh where is it down here uh hold on a sec guys sorry my notes are good are a bit messy um yeah uh is that right sorry uh I think the important thing or, or the, the trend you're seeing here, particularly when it comes to evangelicals looking at this text, is you're seeing like a sort of consolidation of the roles of different gods under this one heading. Um, and evangelicals will point to that and say, well, they're just different names for this one God. Like they're all different aspects. So if if you look at Psalm 91, for example, Kip, I don't know if this is where you're going, but there's two distinctions. You have God, big G, but then you also have Lord, you know, big L. Is that, are we talking about two different beings in that scenario? So actually, yeah, that's, that's actually, I, I think that that might be what I was, what I was uh, trying to tease out. I had a different text in my, in my head, but maybe I'll just, I'll just read the first couple of verses of this. Uh, oh, you who dwell in the shelter of the most high. Again, this is Elion. All you who dwell in the shelter of Elion and abide in the protection of 
Shaddai. That's another divine name. Um, it is it is used frequently, in particular, in the book of uh, Genesis, uh, and within the the narrative of of the uh, the, the Israelites, um, uh, kind of their national their 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 national traditions. Uh, this is the ancient god of their their ancestors that they they no longer worship. Um, so there's there's another name here. Uh, for the deity should die. I say of Yahweh, my refuge and my stronghold, my God in whom I trust, that he will save you from the fowler's trap, from the destructive plague. He will cover you with his pinions. He will, you will find refuge under his wings. Um, what's happening in this text, in particular in those first three lines, uh, you dwell in the shelter of Elyon, you abide in the protection of Shaddai, I say of Yahweh, my refuge and my stronghold. Uh, what's happening here is kind of what I was getting at, where uh, and what you had mentioned, uh, uh, Jordan, where where the you see this amalgamation occurring within the text as well. There seems to be a concerted effort here to um, to to try and and combine these ideas into uh, who Yahweh became for the Israelites. Um, one of the, uh, we all know the, uh, the, the very famous story, uh, at the beginning of the book of Job. Uh, it, it starts with, uh, with, uh, all literally all the sons of God, uh, coming into the presence of Yahweh. Uh, this is a, a clear description of the divine council. Yahweh is depicted as the king of the gods, basically sitting, sitting, you know, in judgment, sitting in court with his his advisors, the, his his fellow uh, deities. Um, another famous passage, uh, Genesis chapter one, verse uh, verse twenty six. I think it's verse twenty six. Um, interestingly, Genesis one uh, twenty six. So this is, uh, yeah, this is, uh, this is the uh, priestly creation story. Um, and when it, uh, when it comes to the creation of humankind, God says, invoking the first person plural verb here, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. Um, it's the, the same expression is used again in uh, Genesis chapter 11, I believe, in the story of the Tower of Babel. Yahweh, in that story, not Elohim as it is in this story, addresses seemingly the divine council and says, let us go down and, uh, and confuse their languages. I remember so, the first time I read that going through. In, the Trinity. Like, it's like, oh, well, no, like the first time I had the realization that there was an us there and I just didn't just skim through it. I was like, wait, who is us? Like, mm. are, is it like the royal we us or is it like, <laughs> I was right? thinking, yeah. like, is it the royal we like the queen might say, let us go do this? Yeah. Um, but no, and that, and that was an explanation for, all, you know, mm. uh, in some circles, that's that's how uh, that's how some people came to understand it. Well, this must this mu because we know we know that the Israelites were always monotheists. They couldn't mean, you know, that God or Yahweh is speaking to other gods. It's it, it's it must mean this must be the royal we. Um and, you know, a, a very popular explanation among evangelicals still is that this is the trinity, right? This is God the Father speaking. God to talking Jesus, to himself. <laughs> Holy Spirit, yeah. yeah. So let's go do this. So um, I mean, that's just that, that's just some of the the simple background information. Uh, now let's see if we want to do this right away. I've got another. I've got another uh, text here. I think I, in my notes here I say that uh, Yahweh is the patron god of Israel and Judah, but also clearly often exercises dominion and authority over other gods. Um, as we've seen in these these other passages, right? But not always. So um, maybe if one of you could read Second uh, Kings chapter three verses twenty six to twenty seven, uh, and just to set this up, this is a story about um, about a campaign 
that uh, uh, Israel uh, undertakes against uh, Misha, the king of the Moabites. And um, they have beaten back the Moabites basically all the way to their uh, to their homeland, to their 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 uh, city, uh, I think it's called Kir um, and uh, and then we pick up the story there. If one of you can read it, yeah. when the king of Moab saw that the battle was going against him, he took with him seven hundred swordsmen to break through opposite the king of Edom, but they could not. Then he took his firstborn son, who was to succeed him and offered him as a burnt offering on the wall. And great wrath came upon Israel, so they withdrew from him and returned to their own land. Is that the right verse? So that's that's correct. So yeah. <laughs> uh, um, just uh, what what did your what did your translation say in the uh, in in the last verse there? Uh, after he offered up his son as a burnt offering, what did the text say? You're reading NRSV, right? Yeah, NRSV updated. Uh, and great wrath came upon Israel, so yeah. they withdrew from him and returned to their own land. So what's going on here? Well, it sounds like the the one king is losing, so he makes a very valuable sacrifice to his god, and that god intervenes on his behalf and kicks Israel's butt. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's not a, it, 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 it's couched in somewhat passive language. Um, you know, the writer of this story is going, we got our asses kicked. Uh, he's, he's, he's kind of, he's well, softening it. It's almost bit, like an but... apologetic, like, well, we lost because this other God intervened. That's almost like that. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, so uh, there's a couple of interesting things happening in just these, these couple of ver verses here. Uh, one of which is uh, is is that Misha makes this this tremendously valuable uh, human sacrifice out of total desperation, right? Uh, he feels like he's got no other choice, and it works. It seems to work. He offers up his heir, his firstborn son, to his god Kemosh, and Kamosh intervenes just as you just as you pointed out Jordan this this is what's going on so not only does Kamosh intervene but Kamosh overpowers Yahweh uh mm. in this story uh it's his his intervention is enough to drive uh the Israelites back one of the really really cool things about um about this story also is that uh, we have uh, an inscription that dates to the 9th century, uh, and it's called the Moabite Stone or the Misha Stele because it was erected by this king. Uh, and he describes uh, his encounters uh, with the Israelites, and there is some conjecture about this, but uh, it does uh, some scholars. Uh, there are scholars who suggest that that these these uh, these stories actually align. That this is this is a description of what happened from the other side. Uh, so you know, we just read the 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 little bit about uh, uh, you know Israel's account of of this of this encounter, and we also have Misha's account of this encounter. So. Uh, I'll just read it for you. It says they advanced an onslaught striking hard against Moab. They will tear down the cities, every fertile field, every, each man will hurl. Oh, uh, sorry. No, that's the, that's the biblical text, uh, here. This is, so this is the, uh, this is the, 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 uh, the Misha, um, Stile. And Kemosh, this is Misha speaking. Kemosh is his God. He says, Kemosh said to me, go take Nebo from Israel. So I went by night and fought against it. Uh, from the break of dawn until noon, taking it and slaying all, 7,000 men, boys, women, girls, and maidservants. For I had devoted them to destruction for Ashtar Kemosh. And I took from there the, and then it's blank, but something, it says he took from there something belonging to Yahweh, dragging them before Kemosh. So people, uh, maybe maybe the, the, the sons of Yahweh or 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 the priests of Yahweh, we don't know. But he dragged them before Kemosh, and the king of Israel had built Yahaz, and he dwelt there while he was fighting against me. 
But Camus drove him out before me. And I took from Moab 200 men, all first class warriors, and set out against Yahaz and took it in order to attach it to the district of Devon. So uh, one of the things that's notably absent from the story is his, his uh, any mention of his offering up uh, his son as a sacrifice. But, and it's not, it, it's also not entirely clear that this is exactly the same event, but there is some overlap in, uh, in what's happening here. In particular, uh, the, 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 the stationing of the King of Israel so far south from his own, uh, from his own kingdom to, uh, to fight against, uh, to fight against Misha, that that's an overlap. So I don't know. I, I like it when these, when, when we have these, these neat third, third party, um, sources for some of this stuff. It's nice because a lot of times we've got the one, one side, yep. right. And, uh, it's nice when you have something like that and you can contrast the two, which should anybody else, you know, if you read that and you can see how different there is overlap, like you said, but the one side is a very different account of why they got their ass kicked compared to the <laughs> other side. Uh, that should give you some pause when we've only got the one side, you know? Yeah. And I wouldn't say, and I'm not, I'm not bringing this up to suggest that Misha's account is any more accurate. Well, sure. They're both right? propagandizing for their own yes, purposes. Yes, exactly. Right? Yeah. Exactly. It's like, it's oh like, no, I, it was fine. Them. I just drove <laughs> yeah. them before me because yeah. my God is so strong. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, uh, so yeah, gods, they're all over the place in the Hebrew Bible, and I think if you uh, if if you're sensitive to the text, uh, you can actually see pretty clearly uh, all the way throughout. And I'll 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 suggest this to you now that. Uh, that there is actually no monotheism in the Hebrew Bible at all. All of these texts that we tend to read as monotheistic, uh, you can read or, or they work maybe even better in a worldview where there are other gods out there, other gods of other nations, uh, either that our God is just way better than, or our God has told us you just need to stay away from. So, like, so many of the, the strong induction, injunctions in, in particular in Deuteronomy and throughout the Deuteronomistic history, that's uh, Joshua through Second uh, Kings, against worshipping other gods really only makes sense in a polytheistic world. I mean... <laughs> It, it, yeah, it makes sense to, you don't have an injunction against worshiping other gods if there aren't other gods to worship. Right, right? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, yeah. Do you want to so, move on to the next point? Yeah. So, just to kind of uh, summarize to this point, um, you can still see signs of, and it's sometimes pretty clear signs, that there are other gods that are literally struggling against Yahweh in the Hebrew Bible. And that points to, at least at the time, um, they may have been more henotheistic, perhaps, where there's like one God that's worthy of worship, but there are other gods, right? Um, and, but you can also see signs where they're struggling against that, where they're kind of lumping in uh, uh, attributes to their one chosen God, kind of almost erasing the previous history. Um, is that an accurate summation? No, that's, that's pretty good. Um, there are there are terms that scholars will use like henotheistic or uh, monolo uh, mono monolatry. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's a hard one. I, I, I swear it's it's only one beer, guys. I... Well, no scholars do that so that you know they don't want people to be able to pronounce it easier. It makes them look more. Irritated. You got to get something for that uh, that exactly. ivory tower education. So, so it's like the but worship of one god, yeah. Yeah, so you are you are basically prioritizing uh, the service of one god over all the other gods. Uh, polytheism may be more properly in this context can be understood as the worship of multiple gods at the same time, and we do have uh, evidence of that in the Hebrew Bible, but it's often uh, the focus of, of polemics, right? We do have good reason, though, to think that these are these are, are late afterthoughts. Uh, I often like to tell the story of, um, you know, I, if you look at a text like Jeremiah chapter 44, uh, Jeremiah 
is um, is living in. He's been taken to to, to Egypt um, with uh, with these refugees from uh, Jerusalem after after the after Nebuchadnezzar's second invasion and after a, a an attempted uh, coup that goes bad. Uh, a bunch of uh, uh, of the citizens just just pack up and go to Egypt, and they take Jeremiah with them. And while they're living there, uh, it says that they're continuing to worship this this um, this goddess identified as Malekat Hashemayim, or the Queen of the Heavens, the Queen of the Sky. Uh, most scholars suggest that this is actually the goddess Asherah, who we know very well through uh, again the Ugaritic literature, the the the, the Canaanite texts from uh, Ugarit. Uh, there's also good reason to think, and we'll, we'll, we'll get into a couple of the pieces of evidence there. There's also good reason to think that through this early history, Yahweh was always worshipped alongside uh, a female deity, and Asherah, the goddess Asherah, uh, was also worshipped in the temple. We have uh, an, a text, in uh, 2 Kings chapter 23, where it says Josiah actually took the Asherah pole out of the temple and he ground it up and then he burned it and then he scattered it on the graves of the uh, common people. Because he's such a nice guy. <laughs> um, but, uh, but so, I mean, these, these texts are all, we, they, they're all written from the perspective that this is all very, very bad. Uh, but when you start to recognize that this is late royal propaganda, and when you start to read some of the, the nature of some of the, the uh, uh, complaints that are, that are leveled within the text against you know, the writers and the ruling class, you start to see, you know... In particular, within the archaeological picture as well, it sure doesn't look like Yahweh was ever just worshipped exclusively, but that he was always accompanied by other deities. So I started this story about Jeremiah. In Jeremiah chapter 44, the people come to him uh, and and they ask him uh, for a prophecy, and and he basically lays into them for their continued worship of the queen of the skies, of Asherah. And their response to him is actually quite telling. They respond to Jeremiah and they say, look, we've always worshipped Asherah, the queen of the sky. And all this time that we have worshipped Asherah, the queen of the sky, things have been good. We've always had plenty to eat. It's always been peaceful. There were never any wars. But then ever since we started abandoning that, that's when things went to shit. When you started pro, you know, <laughs> promoting your program of exclusive Yahweh worship, that's when things started to go bad for us. So thanks, Jeremiah. We'll stick with the Queen of Heaven. That's pretty crazy. Um, well, so I how think, does... Sorry, one thing that you, you said that sticks out to me that I think is worth emphasizing just generally, you were talking about this being royal propaganda and i think something that's easy for people who who don't study history to miss because right now in the time we're living in everyone's literate we can all write to varying degrees right but in the ancient world literacy itself was an elite thing like most people didn't have time or the need totally. to be able to read or write much less read or write scripture or books and so it's almost it's not quite this extreme but it's like imagine the only account we have is america where jeff bezos's di diary entry <laughs> Right, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. I would argue people yeah, don't have time to read or write right now either. But, uh, that's true. <laughs> or, 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 <laughs> yeah, no, that I, that's a good point, and I, you know, we the one of the ways that I I, I like to present this as well is is uh, literature was controlled before the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. Whatever literature they had was controlled by the priests there. Who also, you know, controlled the service in the temple. Uh, the temple was right next to the palace, and this is always by design. Uh, it's not really a national temple. This is not. This is not a building for the people. It's a building for the king. It's his 
It's his royal chapel, essentially. So if you think about it in those terms, most people, uh, with even just within the city of Jerusalem, so most people who could who lived within walking distance, let's not even talk about the people who, who live, you know, out in the hinterlands, but most people who even just live within walking distance of the temple probably never even saw the inside of it, ever. You know, the only people who were allowed inside were priests. Men, supposedly, were allowed inside the inner court, but you're still not inside the building. You're just, you know, you're just standing outside of the, the temple. And then, you know, women were, again, separated even uh, an, another step uh, from there, if the texts are to be believed about uh, about the, the form and the function of this ancient structure. So that's just the people in Jerusalem. The people who live out in the hinterlands, they don't, they, they probably neither know nor care about whatever the king and his fancy priests are doing in the temple. And that's really what we see replete throughout the archaeological record in the uh, the region from the period are these family shrines with these little these little altars uh, where they would they would burn incense and they would they would make these these small offerings and most often to feminine deities. So that actually brings up one thing that I wanted to ask about, and uh, Pat kind of mentioned it earlier. We're talking about the evidence in the scriptures and the written record, um, yeah. but what evidence is there outside of the written record, altars, statues, that sort of thing, a kind of physical remnants of this kind of history? So, I mean, there is there is a lot. Uh, I'll, I'll show a couple of pieces uh, here as we go. Um so uh, do you want me to just show these now? Maybe maybe now is a good time to do that. Sure, yeah. So, um, yeah, let me just uh, set this up. I will uh, while you're show doing that, a couple Pat of says, things. Uh, he, want, he emphasizes the activities taking place in the temple were done by the king on, on behalf of the nation, not by the nation yeah. on behalf of themselves. That's a very good point. Thank you, Pat. So uh, this, is a, this is quite a famous uh, inscription. This is from Kintulat uh, Ajrud. Uh, it dates to uh, the 9th century uh, BCE. What you have pictured here are some, some figures, uh, three clear figures. And uh, scholars uh, are, are mixed in their opinions about who these are. But the majority will tell you that uh, these are depictions of the gods, the the. The thought is that that the figure um, with with the uh, with with the member dangling dangling down between his legs, we know that's the boy. Uh, that is most likely Yahweh uh, standing just behind him, and we recognize her by her her breasts, which are these little circles drawn on her chest. Uh, this is probably his Asherah, and the reason. Uh, scholars think this is because the inscription uh, just above uh, Yahweh's headdress says uh, to Yahweh uh, of Shamaron and his Asherah. Uh, so this is, uh, this is one of several uh, surviving inscriptions from the period which provide clear evidence to us uh, of Yahweh in the company of a goddess of and Asherah. Uh, so that's one. I'm imagining <laughs> that Yahweh, like, so centuries ago, millennia now, they were, like, they were married, and then they had a divorce, and he's like, <laughs> kids, don't listen to your mother. She's dead to you. Like, don't you dare go to her house. <laughs> uh, David of Oakland, there's a guy in the background. He wants to know if that's Jesus in the background reading a book. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, probably. Um, I have to go back and look and read uh, exactly who all the figures are uh, or who it's speculated. I, it's uh, yeah. There's there's uh, that is also a divine figure, but uh, as to the specific identity, it's it's mixed. But we have lots of options, right? Throughout uh, the throughout 
Canaanite uh, literature within Canaanite religion, there were there were plenty of different gods who did different things and plenty of goddesses as well. So this is really quite a remarkable piece. This is on display at the Israel Museum in Jerusalem. Uh, this is the uh, the the Ta uh, the Ta'anak altar stand. Uh, it it stands about uh, about twenty five or thirty centimeters. It's just a little offering stand you put some some incense or some 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 food stuffs on on it and you 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 burn it in offering to uh to the god or the goddess uh you'll notice several uh different figures carved into uh the reliefs and it it's thought that that uh on the bottom here is and i think i can zoom in on this yeah so if we zoom in on this at the bottom here this is a female. Uh, most scholars identify this figure as Asherah, standing between uh, two lions. Uh, these creatures on the second level are uh, Chedabin, these, these fearsome guardians of the uh, throne of the gods. Uh, and I don't remember who those guys are, but they're rather terrifying looking, also likely you know, divine creatures. And at the top, we have the representation of an animal with a with a disc over top of it. This is this is probably a representation of of a bull or a cow with a sun. And this is fairly common uh, for Baal or potentially also uh, Yahweh. Um, we were unsure about that, but that's kind of a cool this this dates back to the 10th century, by the way. So that's kind of a cool little object that uh, that just shows uh, some of the variety of uh, religious expression from the period. And then I've got one more here to show you before we start talking about uh, Dead Sea Scrolls, which is is where I'll spend most of my time and my focus. Uh, so in this last one, this is actually this one is quite interesting because it's it's fairly late. Um, where is it? There it is. So. Uh, this is a coin, uh, that was minted in Palestine, in the Yehud during the Persian period. So this dates to, uh, the fifth or maybe the fourth century on the, uh, one side, you have a picture of a, a man, uh, with a helmet on his head. On the other side, you have a picture of a God and in the inscription, it says, uh, it's it's either Yaho or it's Yehud, um, but scholars are in agreement that this figure seated on the on the wheeled the winged wheel throne is Yahweh. Uh, you'll notice that uh, there is uh, another. It looks like a face almost uh, down uh, at at like knee level height of Yahweh. Uh, it has been suggested that this is potentially another deity who is who is um, uh, prostrating or or, or or giving service uh, before Yahweh. But what is remarkable about this is that this is in Palestine in the fourth or fifth century BCE. So this is like this is supposed to be, you know, when everybody was a strict monotheist, and and also. This was supposed to be when nobody was allowed to make images of Yahweh. <laughs> yeah, so, well, you know, <laughs> <laughs> uh, one of the other things I'll, I'll just I'll just mention this briefly. Um, in terms of our our, our sources for early Judaism um, from the Persian period, we don't have a lot. We have a little bit, uh, but one of our main sources is actually uh, a collection of of tons of literature from the uh the the isle of elephantine which is in uh egypt a uh, a jewish colony lived out in elephantine in the in the uh, uh early fourth late fifth early fourth uh century bce and we have tons of their correspond they had correspondences that they wrote back and forth to the priesthood in uh in jerusalem uh, but what's interesting is is the uh, the Jews who lived in Elephantine appear not to have known a thing about the Torah. Um, they had their very own temple of Yahweh and had other gods <laughs> in their temple <laughs> of Yahweh that they worshipped on a regular basis. This didn't seem to be a problem. They were in regular 
uh, communication with the priesthood back in Jerusalem about things like like festivals and 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 timing for for uh, certain rites and things. Um, but uh, it, it, the the other interesting thing is is we see in the uh, in the uh, um, the the names that appear throughout the uh, the Elephantine archive uh, contain theophoric elements of both Yahweh and other Egyptian deities. So this uh, for some time, uh, scholars when when the uh, the Elephantine archive was first discovered. Uh, the the initial reaction was well these were a bunch of weird renegade Jews who uh, who were were far enough removed from the Jerusalem temple that they just got totally corrupted and mixed up in in all this other stuff I believe the the position on that has swung quite a bit and Elephantine the Elephantine literature is now pretty widely regarded as one of our best sources for Judaism in the uh, or or pre-Judaism, if you want to call it that, whatever it was uh, that Yahweh cultists were doing in the, uh, in the 4th century BCE. So... Oh, also, I'll, I'll just say one other thing too, sorry, uh, about Egypt. There's a story in, uh, in the 2nd century, um, uh, Onias III is, uh, is murdered uh, by a rival, uh, his brother, uh, Jason, uh, who, who then pays, um, um, uh, Antiochus IV, uh, for the priesthood. Uh, Onias' son, Onias IV, uh, flees to save his own life and ends up in Leontopolis, which is kind of on the other side of Egypt, uh, is closer, uh, to the Red Sea. And, uh, while there, Onias the Fourth sets up his own temple of Yahweh that we know about from uh, Josephus, and as far as we know, it stood there for maybe two hundred years and was active. Uh, so, at the same time that the Jerusalem Temple was active, so, at the same time that the Samaritan Temple on Mount Gerizim was active, so so this you know, picture that a, there was one temple and one temple only. Forever and ever, amen. Not accurate. Uh, Pat with $5 asks, uh, what do you think about the general dismissal of Can Canaanite statues found in the same regions where Israel was dominate? Yahweh, maybe? Uh, I think there's there's potential. Yeah, I think that's a possibility uh, for for to give people some context. Uh, because of the uh, strict... Uh, restrictions in the Torah on making images of Yahweh. Um, the it it has been common for uh, some scholars just to to dismiss any sorts of uh, figurines. We have piles of these figurines from the region uh, depicting gods and goddesses, uh, and and one of the common responses has been, well, none of these could possibly be Yahweh, so it must be El, it must be Baal. Um, because you're not allowed to make uh, <laughs> humans don't break, and as we know, yeah, no rules. human has ever broken a rule. Well, <laughs> uh, yeah, and, and there's very good reason to think too that uh, that uh, this rule was just not even in place anywhere near uh, this early. Uh, that this is something that came quite a bit later. Um, if you haven't read Francesca Stavrakopoulos book God and Anatomy, you should. Uh, and in there, she talks about how um, she thinks that the Ark of the Covenant was was originally a statue of Yahweh, a, a an idol essentially, a full bodied uh, figure um, that was then you know scrubbed by by later redactors who became really uncomfortable with that sort of thing. Mm. So, um, but let's uh, maybe maybe now's the time. Uh, to jump into the um, into into the texts, I know that you are just like chomping at the bit to talk about the Dead Sea Scrolls. So yeah, we've talked about the Bible, we've talked about uh, the physical evidence. Now let's talk about other uh, written evidence. Yeah, so the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, pro they they provide these these are uh, Jewish manuscripts which date between uh, roughly two hundred 
BCE all the way up to the fall of the temple in Jerusalem, the fall of Jerusalem in 70 uh, CE. So roughly 250 years thereabouts. Uh, they were collected by a group of um, uh, a, a Jewish sect uh, we identify with, with the Essenes who appear to have been living out in this, uh, in this, this communal uh, setting uh, and waiting for the, uh, basically waiting for the last days, waiting for the end of the world. These were a group of uh, elite level, like high level uh, disenfranchised priests uh, for the most part. And as a result, uh, there was probably a high level of literacy within this community compared to the rest of, uh, of the region. And uh, as a result, we have piles and piles of literature that they either wrote or they copied or they, they collected. Uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls are, are important as sources for the Bible because over 200 of the manuscripts are actual copies of texts from the Bible. And they are far and away our oldest copies of uh, biblical texts written in Hebrew and in Aramaic. So um, what I'm going to get into now is, is some of the textual evidence uh, for, the, uh, for, for, for the polytheistic roots of, uh, of Israelite religion. I think I've got it over here, don't I? All right, so I'm just going to share my screen here, and I'm going to talk about a, uh, a couple of really, really, really cool uh, manuscripts. All right, so don't freak out, guys. There we go. All right, so we're going to spend uh, the rest of uh, this part of this presentation in uh, Deuteronomy 32. Uh, Deuteronomy 32 might be one of the most important uh, individual texts of the Hebrew Bible, uh, precisely because it's quite old. But also because it seems to, um, it seems to provide sort of the formative uh, mandate for uh, what would be what we would come to recognize as as Israelite religion before it turned into into uh, uh, early Judaism, and uh, it the uh, Deuteronomy thirty two is is a poem. That's otherwise known as the Song of Moses. Uh, scholars are mixed on whether this was a, the original kernel, the original core of Deuteronomy, and the rest of the book of Deuteronomy developed around it, or whether this was just an independent uh, poem that was inserted into the book of Deuteronomy. I tend to take the former position. I think that um, uh, when, when we're told in the Deuteronomistic history about uh, Hilkiah, the high priest, discovering the book of the law and then uh, bringing it before Josiah the king uh, and him reading it and then having it um, uh, interpreted by Cholda, the, uh, the prophet. Uh, I tend to think that, that it's the Song of Moses that they're talking about. Uh, and this seems to align uh, it, this aligns pretty well with with some of the things that Holda says in her response to the king, and it also appears to align pretty well with the uh, with the do, with the reforms, the religious forms that Josiah undertook as a result. Um, but this is one of one of the reasons why Deuteronomy thirty two is so fascinating is because it's so old, um, and it preserves this really interesting picture, certainly in the opening part of the the poem of of this conception of uh, Israelite or Jewish origins. Actually, if one of you guys has has the text open, if you could just read Deuteronomy 32, <coughs> verses 1 through 9 to start us off. I got yeah, it. I got uh, it. Go for so, it. Give ear, O heavens, and I will speak. Let the earth hear the words of my mouth. May my teaching drop like the rain, my speech condense like the dew, like gentle rain on grass, like showers on new growth. For I will proclaim the name of the Lord, ascribe greatness to our God. The rock, his work is perfect, and all his ways are just. A faithful God without deceit, just and upright is he. 
yet his degenerate children have dealt falsely with him, a perverse and crooked generation. Do you thus repay the Lord, O foolish and senseless people? Is not he your father who created you, who made you and established you? Remember the days of old. Consider the years long past. Ask your father, and he will inform you, your elders, and they will tell you. When the Most High apportioned the nations, when he divided humankind, he fixed the boundaries of the peoples according to the number of the gods. The Lord's own portion was his people, Jacob his allotted share. Awesome. So and then the and then the poem goes on to to describe how how uh, Yahweh found Jacob in in the desert and and nursed him and cared for him and and Jacob rebelled against him and he gets extremely angry about this. Um so but the 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 key text there is in verses 8 and 9. Uh, and you'll probably have picked up on it. Uh, this this first manuscript that I'm showing you is 4Q Deuteronomy J or 4Q37. It dates to about uh, 50 CE. And, uh, this is a, this is a very, very cool manuscript. Um, it, uh, it is not a, a complete copy of the book of Deuteronomy. Even after we've reconstructed it, it's, it's a, uh, it's a smaller text. It contains, scholars, uh, tend to think it contains just Deuteronomy 5, uh, 5, 1 to 6, 3. And then chapter 8, verses 5 to 10. And then chapter 10, verse 12 to 1121. Then Exodus 12, 43 to 13, 16. And then finally, at the very end, it uh, it contains uh, the Song of Moses, uh, Deuteronomy 32, uh, verses 1 to at least verse 9. And we, we're not sure how much beyond that. Uh, so, so it's just like a pocket Bible. They just kind of put all their favorite stuff in. It's like had it. <laughs> so that that's a that that's a popular idea. I'm going to provide a, a slightly different explanation here. Uh, it's 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 small, right? It's uh, there's only 14 lines in a column. It measures about 10 centimeters high. Uh, what is that for you, uh, you Americans? It's probably close to four inches uh, from from top to bottom in a little roll. Um, so th these have often been called excerpted texts. I prefer to think of these as, um, because I don't, I don't, I think oftentimes, uh, the people who, who wrote and collected this literature didn't think about, uh, books in the same way and compositions in the same way that we did. I think this is probably better understood as an independent composition or just a single scroll containing you know the song of moses and some of these other texts which together doesn't make the book of deuteronomy right it's it's something new it's something different so um yeah so we're gonna focus on just this one fragment here and you'll notice you can only see a handful of letters here uh but we're abs you might be asking me kip how on earth do you know that that fragment belongs to all those other fragments. And how do you know that that text is Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 8? Well, what we do is, as scholars, we, we reconstruct the text. And this is really the only way you can sensibly reconstruct the text. It fits uh, Deuteronomy chapter uh, 32, verses 7 and 8. Chapter 7 is, is on the top line there. Uh, you can see Bene Shanot Dor Vador Sha'al Avicha. Sorry. Um, um, understand the, the years uh, from one generation to the next. Ask your father and he will inform you. And then in the second line there, we have the beginning of uh, verse 8 as uh, Jared read, and it says this, when Elion apportioned the nations, this is my translation, an inheritance, when he divided the sons of Adam, he fixed the borders of the people according to the number of the sons of God. And the key word here, oh, and, and it, it goes on, it continues, this part does not survive in the manuscript. So Yahweh's portion is his people Jacob, his allotted heritage. Now, I guess I'll, I'll ask you right at the outset, when you look at these two verses, what do you think is going on here? So it sounds like 
let it's sort of like a, a formation story explaining why there's all these different nations and why Yahweh has this one as opposed to all the rest. Yeah. So you'll notice here Yahweh's portion is his people, his allotted heritage. So, so this is like Yahweh being handed a piece from another deity from or Elyon. Elyon is the one who's apportioning the nations. Now, there is a, a famous uh, evangelical uh, scholar who passed recently by the name of Michael Heiser, which has, has argued that Elyon and Yahweh are actually the same deity. And I will just, I'll, I'll just throw that out there right away and say that from a, just, just from a literary perspective, from a linguistic perspective, that just doesn't make any sense because you don't receive an inheritance from yourself. Yeah. And, and that's what the word here means is allotted heritage. This is an inheritance. This is something you receive from your father. And that's exactly what is very simply depicted in this text. Remember I said, I suggested to you that Elyon, this word Elyon is, is a title used of El, the father, the king of the gods. And this is what he's doing. He's dividing the nations as an inheritance between who? The sons of God. His sons. Which it seems to be, and it seems from what follows, that Yahweh is included in that number and actually receives his own portion, which happens to be his, his people, uh, Jacob or Israel. So... Uh, it's a fascinating text, and one of the reasons why it's so fascinating is because, uh, you know, um, I assume that was the NRSV that you read, Jordan? Yep. Yeah, so the NRSV, because, because they're smart and good, <laughs> uh, have <laughs> updated their translation on the basis of this reading in this particular manuscript, because... In the oh here I've just I've just flagged the uh, the key words here for you. Bene Elohim appears right at the bottom of the manuscript. There it's it's now emblazoned in red. That's the sons of the gods. Uh, this is the uh, we even before we discovered this manuscript, we scholars had suspected that the text actually originally looked something like this on the basis of what read in the uh, Septuagint, which says kata. Uh, Arithmon Angelon Theu, which is he divided them according to the uh, uh, the number of the angels of God. So that's the Septuagint text there. He fixed the boundaries of the nations according to the number of the angels of God. Now, one of the things that the Septuagint likes to do is when it, it encounters this term, Bene Elohim, sons of God, uh, it renders that very uh, frequently just with Angolon Theo, the angels of God. So even before we discovered this manuscript, scholars had suspected that this is what the reading originally was. Um, but they didn't know it because prior to the discovery of this manuscript, this is how it read in the Masoretic text, which is the standard um, the standard edition of the Hebrew Bible. And we didn't have any Hebrew manuscripts which deviated from this particular reading. Instead of Bene Elohim, it read Bene Yisrael, um, which is, I'll get to that in a second, which is translated uh, when Elion apportioned the nations, when he divided the sons of Adam, he fixed the boundaries of the people according to the number of the sons of Israel. Hmm. So at some point in time, this text has been uh, altered. It's been changed. Uh, why? Well, um, we can't if... have other gods running around. <laughs> <laughs> it seems like that on the face of it, right? So, and I, I, I think that's that's probably that's probably the most the most sensible answer is that. Um, at some point in the transmission history of this text, but we're not sure when uh, somebody was uncomfortable with this idea 
of uh, of Elyon having sons and Yahweh being one of them. I, I would actually suggest that that the discomfort was much more with Elyon with Yahweh being one of the sons of Elyon. Like than it was Yes, exactly. So uh, to fix it, he uh, he 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 changed the text to read Bene Yisrael as opposed to uh, Bene Elohim. Now, I've included here also this, you'll notice I have SP slash MT. MT stands for the Masoretic Text. SP stands for the Samaritan Pentateuch. Um, now, because the suggestion right away may be that this is a text that was changed quite late. The earliest copies of, of the, uh, the actual Masoretic Text only date back to the 10th century CE. So those are like medieval uh, so, you know, you might be worried, oh my God, like what happened in the intervening thousand years? It, it could have been any time in that period. I'll suggest to you that it probably was quite a bit earlier than that because the reading in the Samaritan Pentateuch is the same as in the Masoretic text. So that suggests to us that this is something that probably took place already way back in the second or maybe even the third century uh, BCE. I don't have time to go into the, into the nitty gritty on, <laughs> on, on, uh, the Samaritan Pentateuch. But the idea here is that, uh, there's a break in the tradition between the Samaritan Pentateuch and the Masoretic text at some point in that period, second, third century BCE. And from that point, moving forward, they kind of have their own independent trajectory. So when we see these two manuscript traditions with the same reading, it indicates that, yeah, it probably was the same reading way back in the second or the third century. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah that makes. Okay. All right. Two so roads. that's, I... yeah, exactly. You trace them back to their, to where they branch off. Right. Yeah. So, and, and that's, yeah. So I, I just, I just, I just raised that point as, as a way of, of helping us to locate when this change took place. And um, I suggest here, this is, this is basically, very simply, uh, I think this is what's going on. The original reading appears here in this small manuscript of Deuteronomy, Farky Deuteronomy J, Sons of God. It's translated by the Septuagint, uh, which took place, again, probably sometime in the 3rd uh, or very early 2nd century BCE, to Angelon Theu, angels of god uh so they're they're reading this text and and they're they're just translating bene Elohim with angelotheu and then the uh the samaritan pentateuch masoretic text um their parent version whatever it was came along and said this is no good we can't have this we need to change it to uh bene yisrael sons of israel uh now i'm just gonna pause there for a second and talk a little bit about uh, one other thing uh, with regards uh, to the transmission history here. How is it? Did, did you notice the date um, that that you remember the date of that that particular manuscript? Fifty that I have on the screen. Yeah, so that's like twenty years after Jesus, right? It's pretty yeah. late. So how does a reading like that survive that long if the change was made? couple hundred years earlier mm -hmm. so one of the reasons I, I i picked up this this idea from a scholar by the name of benjamin zemer um and i really like it i think it's it's compelling so you remember i said i said to you that this is a it's a small manuscript so it's not a complete copy of the book of deuteronomy and this is important for understanding what's going on with this reading uh if Within what one of the things that we see in in early Jewish scripture transition is this tendency towards harmonization, and what I mean by that is that as they're collecting these texts together and as their collections are growing, there is this concerted effort to start bringing everything into alignment to make sure it all is saying the same things. So this is, uh, we see great examples of this. The Samaritan Pentateuch itself is doing just that. 
when you read the Samaritan Pentateuch, it's really interesting because it's actually taken whole chunks of text from the book of Deuteronomy and then just slam them right into the book of Numbers because it's the same story, right? And they have to make sure every all the details are exactly the same. So they basically rewrite the same story uh, so that everything matches and then they, they reproduce it in both places. Uh, so this within this tendency, this strong tendency, we see this within other uh, Torah manuscripts in particular in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, but within this culture where everybody's very concerned to make sure that everything matches and everything aligns, uh, a change like this, I would suggest, I, I think part of it is prompted by just anxiety about, like I said, Yahweh being subservient to Elyon. But part of it too is, is uh, this idea of um, how the nations were numbered. Why were the nations numbered according to the sons of Israel? Well, in the book of Genesis, in Genesis chapter 49, we read that uh, when uh, Jacob took his family down to Egypt, that uh, there were 70 people. Um, we also read in Genesis chapter 10 in the Table of Nations uh, if you count all the nations that are listed there, these are supposedly all the nations of the world. There's 70 nations. Uh, there's a long-standing tradition in Ugaritic literature as well as Hittite literature of the gods dividing all the nations among 70 subservient gods. So this is this. There's this common tradition of you know 70 nations originally in the. Uh, you know, from the beginning. So uh, a clever reader, a careful reader of the Hebrew Bible will go, ah, there were also 70 sons of Jacob. So must have just numbered the nations on the basis of 70 sons of Israel. So that's, that's where the change takes place in the book of Deuteronomy. And it makes sense there because this text is in conversation with these other texts from Genesis, right? Um, but it doesn't make its way into the smaller manuscript because this isn't a copy of the book of Deuteronomy. It's not a Torah, right? So the need for harmonization is not as pronounced. This is probably maybe a liturgical text, something that you, you, you perform or you sing or you chant in uh, in a synagogue setting or or in a a setting of of worship uh, and as a result when when you don't have these same sorts of harmonizing tendencies at work a smaller manuscript like this then just doesn't have it there's no reason to make this change so it just you know it it carries forward the ancient reading unproblematically that's interesting so you're saying that in like the main show the Torah proper, there's yeah. this drive to make sure everything kind of lines up and is theologically sound and everything. But in these sort of more ancillary texts, they just they just weren't bothered. Yeah, ah, that's and I and I think I think this also feeds into. I mean, one of the things we see in the Dead Sea Scrolls that's intensely interesting is they have multiple copies of these different texts, and so many of them are so different. Like we have. You know, there are dramatic differences between uh, versions of Jeremiah or Exodus or Samuel in the Septuagint compared to the Masoretic text. And in the Dead Sea Scrolls, they had, you know, copies of both of them. And it, it, it's this is I was just on um, uh, Data Over Dogma and, and uh, Dan McClellan's uh, podcast. And we talked a little bit about this and he made the point and he's right that this is just not a question that seemed to bother people too much about having you know, competing versions or competing forms of individual stories. Now, within a single manuscript, that's where, you know, that's where things need to be brought brought into alignment. But, you know, when you're when you've got these these, like you said, these ancillary traditions, it's something that that they they seem to have a strong toleration for. Hmm. It's a good lesson for some people today, I think. Interesting. But, uh, so, but there's this is not the only one. There's another one, and uh, this manuscript is at least as cool, 
it might even be cooler. Uh, and it's not as well known. So this is uh, 4Q, Deuteronomy Q. We only have a few uh, fragments of this. Um, and what you see on your screen here is the very end of Deuteronomy 32. And you'll notice there's all... You're not sharing Oh, that. I'm... No, well, that's sad. I should... I'm, ima I'm imagining it, though. It's, it's, it's really great. <laughs> okay. It's coming. I promise. Uh, I didn't say it. Okay. I was thinking it. Though. Isn't that cool? <laughs> now you're, now you're happy you saw it. So, <laughs> so you'll notice, uh, there's, there's a couple of really interesting things. Uh, one of the things you'll notice, uh, right at the outset is on the left hand side, there's all this blank space and, uh, the edge is, is on a, is fairly straight as well. So this is a clear indication that this is the end of the manuscript. So um, within our Bibles, uh, what follows Deuteronomy 32 is is Deuteronomy 30, 33, wouldn't you know it? Um, but clearly that wasn't in this particular manuscript. Uh, and what you're looking at here too is, is the entire um, height of the manuscript from top to bottom. So it comprised the, the whole manuscript only comprised of uh, 11 lines in a column. And again, it was quite small, measuring about 10 centimeters or uh, somewhere close to four inches. So, and uh, you'll notice too that the column structure is really, is really narrow. Uh, like there's, there's each individual line only has a handful of words in it. So, uh, I, uh, specialists like me would call this a stichometric, uh, arrangement because this is a poem, all the individual, uh, Hebrew poetry works in terms of parallelism, uh, either, either most of the time you have, have statements in corresponding pairs, one after the other, and, uh, quite often they are they are um, written just on their own line like that. So each individual line represents a poetical stico. So I'm just going to zoom in here um, and maybe just pull up. Uh, uh, now, don't cheat. So maybe pull up like uh, Deuteronomy 32, verse 43, but in a version that's not the NRSV. Right, maybe well like. Can what, you do what that? Do you what version? Do you uh, want? Try the NIV. I bet the NIV okay. sucks. While Jared's pulling up the NIV, uh, we have a super chat from Core Hill, who I think that's a Carthage symbol. It's pretty cool. About the Dead oh, Sea cool. Scroll fragments we have of Daniel, are the scrolls containing only parts of the book older than the two that we have of the whole book? Thanks for your super chat. Oh, that's a great question. Um, should should I answer that now? It could take a while. <laughs> <laughs> if you can give uh, a brief answer, if that's we, possible, the book that we have are, are the scrolls containing only parts of the book older than the two that had the whole book. So, Cor what Corhill's getting at here is that there are eight manuscripts of the Book of Daniel and the Dead Sea Scrolls. Two of those manuscripts can be reconstructed to have contained the entire book from chapter one through chapter thirteen. Virtually all the other six. Um, cannot be reconstructed to contain the entire book. Some of those manuscripts look like they only contained um, the Aramaic tales, which appear in chapters two through through six, and maybe uh, the Aramaic vision in chapter seven. Some of them look like they're only one or a couple of the Hebrew prophecies, which appear in the second half of Daniel, in, in Daniel uh, chapter eight through uh, 13. And we know this because of how we can reconstruct them. Uh, the a lot of these manuscripts are really small. It's just not possible to get the entire, the entire book into there. One of the manuscripts actually just contains uh, the, uh, there's a, the beginning of uh, Daniel chapter nine is a prayer, a penitential prayer. You'll know, you'll remember the story. He, um, so it starts by Daniel uh, pouring over the book of Jeremiah and he, and he reads the prophecy of 70 years and he's upset. Um, and he, and he, you know, prays to God to help him understand the meaning of, of the 70 years prophecy. And, 
And uh, in his prayer, he offers this penitential prayer. Oh, God, we were terrible people and we've sinned so greatly and you must be so terribly offended by us. How can you ever, you know, he goes on and on and on through this prayer. Uh, we have one manuscript, which looks like it was just that, like just the prayer. It doesn't even necessarily belong to Daniel in this manuscript. It might just be the prayer on its own without... Uh, without Daniel as the, the speaker. It's, it's really quite wild. But um, I, I hope that answered your question roughly. <laughs> but if that's the best I can do in short notice. Tag me in a chat and we'll, we'll get clarification. <laughs> uh, you okay. have the worst translation up now, Jared? Yeah, I have. I got, well, I got the NIV. So who knows All if right, it's the worst translation. Let's see what it but, says. Um, this is verse 43. Yes. Rejoice. You nations with his people, for he will avenge the blood of his servants. He will take vengeance on his enemies and make atonement for his land and people. Okay. So are you looking at the, the text that I have on the screen? I am now. <laughs> okay. Uh, does that look like what you just read? <laughs> Not at all. Very different. <laughs> yeah. It's very different. So this is my, this is, uh, my translation of the text from this fragment of uh, this manuscript. And it says, acclaim sky or the heavens. I just like saying sky in uh, when I encountered the word Shemayim in Hebrew, because that's what it is. Uh, when we read heavens, we tend to think of heaven, but that's not, it's not that. It's the sky. All right. So acclaim sky, his people, worship him, all the gods. For the blood of his sons shall he avenge. Vengeance he will turn back on his enemies. Those who hate him he shall repay. He will atone for his land and his people. So right away, your, your attention is drawn to the second line. Worship him. All the gods. Uh, it's just completely absent from the, uh, the translation that you read, which is from the Masoretic text, right? This standard version of the Hebrew Bible. And uh, it, it's, it's a pretty dramatically different uh, version of this same passage. And I'll walk through uh, the differences and the reason for, well, what I think the reasons are for, for the changes. Um, but that's, that's kind of the big one right off is, is this, this flag of there being again multiple gods in in uh, who who are instructed now to offer obeisance um, to to Yahweh, um, and you'll also notice the other uh, a couple of other things. Uh, what did the first line say? Give praise or exalt who? In the in this one or the NIV in the one? Very first in in the NIV. It uh, said, re uh, "Rejoice, you nations, with his nations, people." Nations, right? Yeah. You'll notice it's not nations; it's sky. And then in the third line, it wasn't the blood of his sons he shall avenge. It was he will take vengeance on his enemies. Uh, was that? Or it? how about the line above that? He or he will avenge the blood of his servants. His servants, servants, or his yeah, slaves, right. So there's lots going on here. Lots of changes. So there's the, I mean, there's uh, the, 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 the version that you read, um, which again, it's quite different. So what is going on here? Well, um, I'm going to get rid of that. I'm going to rearrange these. Remember how I told you this is, this is arranged stichometrically. So here we have, and you, it might be hard to see, but I've got them in blue just on the right hand side there. There are three, uh, there are, are, are three individual parallels uh, in this uh, in this in this part of the poem, which make uh, six lines, right? And this is what you see on on the uh, fragment to the right. Those uh, those last one, two, three, four, five, six unbroken lines. Uh, that's exactly. Uh, what appears in verse 43 and I've I've translated each one on uh, on the left so the way Hebrew parallelism works is you're you're basically saying you're making a statement 
and then you're repeating it in other words. So, acclaim sky his people, worship him all the gods. That's the first parallel. For the blood of his sons shall he avenge. Vengeance he will turn back on his enemies. That's the second parallel. Those who hate him he shall repay. He will atone for his land and his people. That's the third parallel. Uh, so that's that's how it looked. Now, how did this change? Well, I've already suggested that I think there was some discomfort with that first, that second stiko. So somebody decided, I'm just going to get rid of that. But now there's a problem. That breaks the parallelism. Uh, yeah, you now have an unbalanced uh, poem, right? And you'll notice on the right here, everything was A, B, or Aleph, Beta, Aleph, Beta, Aleph, Beta. Now it's Aleph, Aleph. Beta, Aleph, Aleph, Beta. Oh, and also he changed, he changed uh, sky uh, to nations because I think there's some discomfort with personifying the sky as you would, you know, uh, a god. Um, and for for some reason, uh, they were also uncomfortable with Yahweh avenging the blood of his sons. Maybe the relationship there is a little too close. I think that has to do with the. Uh, the sons there is actually the sons of Israel um, being depicted as sons of Yahweh, which is a bit odd, but uh, but I think I think that's why the change was made to his servants or his slaves. It's the same word, by the way. Um, so uh, yeah, so we have those changes, and now we've got this unbalanced um, this unbalanced structure. So uh, the the next sensible thing to do is just take out another line. And you can balance up the structure, and you turn it into uh, kind of a chiasm. Uh, instead of an A, B, A, B, A, B structure, you now have like an A, B, uh, B, A structure. You've got acclaimed nations, his people, for the blood of his slaves he shall avenge. Vengeance he will turn back on his enemies. You'll notice there's vengeance in line two, and there's vengeance in line three, and then there's people. In lines one and line four so it's really a very very clever way of uh changing the text and editing the text so that none will be the wiser <laughs> um uh but that's uh that that's that's how it goes so and this manuscript i don't think i mentioned it it's there on the on the bottom this dates to about 50 bce it's a little bit older then than the last one um but uh yeah it's still you know right that's fast that's fascinating like, i don't know why because because it's not like like they were people just like like we're people obviously you know but like some people tend to see the, the past as like some weird like different species they're just people but it's 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 fascinating to me that at some point in history some there was a guy who was looking at this poem it's like well i know this is what was written before but like it can't be right because it's not saying the right thing. So how do I fix yeah, right. this so it's saying the right things but still works as poetry? Like it's, you know, he probably spent like a while figuring that oh, out. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> to sort that all out. I know it's beyond me. I certainly couldn't do it. <laughs> but uh, and that's you know, I like to make. I, I'm I'm glad you made you you raise that point too because one of the things that that just bugs me to no end is this idea that 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 the people who wrote this literature were ignorant or or mm -hmm. you know not uh, not intelligent and I my God uh, it couldn't be further from the truth it takes skill and it takes insight to be able to do something like that yeah I mean only only ignorant in the sense that they weren't modern people with modern knowledge, but that doesn't mean that they were uneducated or unintelligent. They just right. weren't exactly. modern. That's all. That's what it. I think this, what I think this highlights though, is that, you know, what you're talking about earlier, the, uh, the pre biblical context of polytheism and how it's even within the archeological record uh, in the text itself that we have fragments of this polytheism in the land, but you see this transition from polytheism to monotheism in the text and how they're like, well, clearly we only worship one God now. And like, we can't have signs of these other gods. So like there, you see it in practice, like going back to the things like the Dead Sea Scrolls is like evidence of how the text was changed to transition into monotheism. But even while that's happening, 
you've got the guy in the temple who's like fixing this this poem and then you've got the guy in the hinterlands who's like yeah we got yahweh he's great and then we've got yeah exactly we've got all, yeah, the we got all these other gods <laughs> <laughs> who cares <laughs> exactly exactly so yeah it uh and i i i mean i i challenge i challenge everyone uh when it comes to reading your old testament just try your best to take off your your monotheistic lenses like even so even a text some of these these really um uh what's the word i'm looking for so, sort of these these real uh touchstones of monotheism i'm thinking right away of of something like um uh deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 4 the the shema here o israel uh yahweh your god is one you know, you look at that and you think, well, I couldn't be more clear than that, that it, you know, Yahweh is it, one. It's just him. It's it's him alone. Um, but even something like that, that's not exactly what's from an historical perspective. That's not what that particular uh, declaration is about. Um, Jacob, Jacob L. Wright is a um, he's a professor of uh, Bible at Emory uh, university and seminary. He just sent me a copy of, uh, of his new book, uh, called why the Bible. Um, I started reading it and it's great. Um, everybody should, should read it. It's, it's great. But, uh, he talks a little bit about this, this passage and he says this, and I'm just going to quote, um, from this. And it's a very simple explanation of what's happening in a passage like that. He says at the beginning, there was more than one Yahweh. And this is something that we see, like this isn't just common to Israel. This is a, a, a regular thing within uh, the region of Canaan. We think of Baal as a god, the, 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 uh, the patron deity of most of the Canaanites. Um, but even within the biblical text and then within um inscriptions that we've we've uncovered at a few important places you see mention of uh baal of peor is a famous one or baal of uh i believe there's a baal of samaria and there's a there's a baal of um oh it starts with a t i can't remember it offhand but there was this convention that everybody had their own baal and similarly everybody had their own yahweh uh, Jacob Wright says, at the beginning, there was more than one Yahweh. Inscriptions from Kentulet Ajdud. We looked at the uh, the the one uh, inscription at the very beginning. And other places refer to the Yahweh of Samaria, as well as the Yahweh of Temen, which is in Edom. We also know of Yahweh of Jerusalem, as well as Yahwehs from various other places. Eventually... The authors of Deuteronomy, in an effort to consolidate a nation of competing centers, would declare that all these Yahwehs are one and the same. So then, hear, O Israel, Yahweh is our God. Yahweh is one. Not all these other Yahwehs spread all over the place. Just this one. And oh, and he's here in Jerusalem, by the way. <laughs> it's almost like it, it's kind of like that thing you see when you're talking about uh, heresies in early Christianity. Like you see someone pushing back against the idea. Well, they don't push against an idea that isn't there. You know, exactly. You wouldn't need to argue that Yahweh is one if people weren't saying other things. Yeah. Uh, before says, it goes too far, David Oakland uh, for five dollars says this has been a great discussion. Sure. Thanks, Doctor Kip, for a very interesting lecture. Hope for more of the same soon. Uh, you're in luck, David. Thank you for your super chat very much. Uh, Kip has his own channel too. I'm sure you're aware of it. Uh, but also, if you want more on this specific topic, again in the description, he's got a whole course. Uh, what would you say it was? It was 18 lectures, was it? Something. 18 maybe? lectures, 13 hours. Uh, and you, when you buy it, it's yours for life. So you don't even have to. You can just just do it at, at your leisure. I'll mention one other thing. I was on. Um, I guess it was about a month ago now. Uh, I was on uh, Sydney Davis Jr. Jr uh did an event a week-long event called uh skeptic university and i gave a 90 minute lecture all about yahweh over there so you can 
you can just find it by by searching it up. Uh, if you're interested in this particular topic, I spend uh, basically an hour and a half going through uh, the roots of who Yahweh was, what kind what kind of a deity he was, where he came from, uh, his development throughout the text. Uh, yeah, so it's yeah, it's you you can find it over there, and it's basically that lecture is actually. Uh, basically just a full chapter from my 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 next book so uh michael apple you says we could, anyway we get a link you're talking about the link to the thing he's just talking about right now we can probably I, yeah well I we'll will. get it uh kip if you send it to me afterwards we can throw it in the description so yeah i will do just, that just check the description after we, we'll edit it afterwards um so we've spent uh, a while almost two hours wow <laughs> yeah, in almost two hours now, we've I think we've thoroughly established the polytheistic roots that go back behind uh, the text we have now and uh, some of the context there. One question I had um, that actually when I always go through these with my wife to uh, see like it, make sure I'm not missing anything, and this was something she was really interested in was um, as they made this shift from a more polytheistic view to a more henotheistic or even monotheistic view over time. Um, you mentioned earlier that a lot of the worships, the objects of worship in the more rural areas were a lot of more feminine gods. And obviously that does not mm -hmm. persist in the in the tradition as we have it today. So what sort of shifts came along with this overall shift? And other than just like we're shifting from multiple deities down to one, what sort of cultural shifts came along with this? Well, I think the big one is uh, really the disenfranchisement of women. Um, you know, one of the, the, one of the, the crucial elements of worship of goddesses, of female deities, is the participation of women. And if you read your Hebrew Bible, you will notice, uh, and, and if you, <clears throat> if you understand that, uh, within the text, everywhere, where it's it's speaking to a group of people um and you know we can see this through the 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 conjugations of the verbs and the pronouns and and the language that's used in the text they're only ever talking to men um and you will notice by reading carefully your text anywhere where it says something like uh the children of israel that's that's a democratization. It's the sons of Israel. It's men. Uh, so one of the things that you will notice throughout the text is that women have no place within this cult. None. Uh, and I challenge you to, to take a look Take a look at your Bible and and check me on this. There are no women who um, offer like, like who are serving as priests in the temple. Uh, from time to time, there's mention of women, uh, you know, on the outside who are engaged in something like uh, temple service, but this is always, uh, you know, a form of it, it's 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 couched in in uh, derogatory language. In, in such a way that makes makes uh, uh, scholars and observers think that this is actually a an invective or a polemic on this old kind of religion where women were uh, participants. Um, but within the sanctioned worship of Yahweh in the Hebrew Bible, it's all men, for men, it's about men, that's it. So that is easily... Uh, the biggest difference, the biggest change was this, this disenfranchisement of women from public spaces of worship. Um, something that you do see ongoing is uh, the continuation of uh, these, these cultic practices in people's houses. And I expect that this is the reason for that. Women could do what they wanted in, you know, in their own homes, right? So the goddess worship... Um, continue to be very popular and very prevalent uh, among, you know, the ordinary people who really didn't care 
about whatever King Shlomomam was doing in his fancy, fancy temple on the hill in Jerusalem. That they would never see, much less see the inside of. <laughs> yep. So I, but that's that's the big one, though, right? Uh, and I'm sure there's, I'm sure there's, there's attendant things that uh, that come along uh, with that, but that is that is easily the biggest one. I wonder if, like, I don't want to paint with too broad a brush and like suggest that all of any group is any one way, uh, but I wonder if that is part of what has led to uh, patriarchal tendencies in Western culture is this like that the divine being the most high being the one we're worshiping is exclusively and only male whereas if you had divine like people at this at the table almost in the divine table if women were there too if that might have led to a different um conception a different, not like, a different yeah. history a different yeah yeah I I think so right and who knows what that would have looked like um we we have no idea. I I you know I just listened to a, a guy who doesn't on on another channel before this stream. I was just listening to a guy who doesn't know what he's talking about, trying to uh, per persuade the audience that that when that when uh, uh, worship of uh, female deities was was uh, prominent, everything was amazing. Um, well, I mean, they I don't think so. But deities in Rome, and everything wasn't peachy there. You know? <laughs> exactly. Right. Yeah. 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 So, so. Uh, Nitty says, "Don't you make my God trans?" And that's <laughs> something interesting, actually. So, like, there's a a prominent evangelical movement in America that is very anti-trans. Right. This is kind of a tangent, but I'm going to say it anyway. So, um, it's probably they, they a double. Have a, they have a really hard time with pronouns and using people's preferred pronouns. And that always seems strange to me because they, they'll say like, um, what makes a man is a penis or X, Y chromosomes or whatever. God doesn't have any of that. The only reason you call God, he is because he has expressed his preferred pronouns or he, him. Well, I don't know. I saw that. Right? I saw a jar earlier. And God That's had a true. Pretty big penis, well, so. yeah. <laughs> and I, and there are, there are, some descriptions in the Bible as well of, uh, yeah. of God having a pretty spectacular junk. So, and, and his admissions uh, but, were like that of a, no, yeah. Well, I mean, if I'm <laughs> writing a holy book about me. You better believe that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, but I, no, I think it's a good point though. Um, and uh, what, one of the, maybe one of the in interesting things also about the text, uh, the text as we, as, as it survives to us today, uh, there are a number of places. Uh, so there's a technical term that uh, scholars will use called kativ kare, and those are just the Hebrew words for written and read. Um, and uh, you'll get, you know, if you're reading your your Biblia Hebraica, um, you'll you're reading along, and you'll get these little these little notes um, and a reading in the margin. Uh, with a with a, a Hebrew uh, kof beside it, that's that's the the Kare reading, and what's what's happening is that um, at at the time when the Masoretes, like in the medieval period, by the time they're copying the text, they deem it too sacred that even where they encounter mistakes, they can't change them, so they have to make these marginal notes and say, well, the text says this. But this is actually what it's supposed to be. So the text uh, is written this way, but you read mm. Uh, mm. this. And one of the most frequent of the Khatib Kareis is the interchange between the third feminine singular and the third masculine singular pronouns. It's all over the place in there. Um, and, you know, context tells you what's going on. But you know, the 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 text can't be changed. So, well, uh, if you have a few more minutes, we have a couple questions from Simone. Yeah, sure. She's been waiting patiently. <laughs> oh no! Uh, so, the first question we have here uh, got a question: the temples. What do you think of the use? Of, and I don't know Hebrew, so I'm not even going to read Nick it. Nick Dashikam. 
<laughs> in plural in Leviticus 26.31. And uh, Mekdoshe in verse 2 could also be plural because uh, the difference there is just pointing. So what, uh, what, what Simone is bringing up here is that, uh, as you see the text written there, uh, is, is just how the, the Hebrew text was originally written. Uh, without there's no vowels in the uh, in the Hebrew text, not really. There's there's not pure vowels. It's consonantal language, uh, so the vocalic sounds are supplied. And it wasn't until the medieval period that the Masoretes invented this system of dashes and dots that they put underneath the letters to indicate how you should sound them out. Uh, so what she's pointing to here is that the first word Mikdashichem is a uh so that's a a a plural form of uh the word which we generally translate as sanctuary so it's your sanctuaries and then in uh she says in 2631 and in verse 2 mikdashe i'm assuming that this is a singular uh noun with with just a, uh, a suffix. I have to look this up. Um, but she's asking if, uh, if, if the pointing, uh, because, because many words, when you can understand when you don't have vowels, that there's oftentimes a, a word will look exactly the same, but pronounced differently, just based on how you sound it. So context. lots of times, yeah, lots of times we're, guessing and we're you know the or i should say lots of times the rabbi the rabbis who invented the system were guessing or more appropriately just following the tradition they received but there's no guarantee that uh that that the words are um you know necessarily pronounced as they pronounced it i'm going to look it up here just quickly simone i doubt i'll be able to give you a satisfying answer can you bring it up again it's oh. leviticus 26 hold on uh, oh no did you lose it i i can find 26 it 2631 okay thank you 2631 uh yeah make your sanctuaries desolate is uh 2631 uh uh mcdashichem your sanctuaries, and then it's 26 verse 1, I think she said. Uh, why didn't it go? There we go. Uh, all right. So you will not make for yourself uh, idols and images. Uh, was it 26 one uh she says 31 and then verse two is the second one. Oh, verse two sorry i thought sorry yes uh yeah so it's uh yeah it's umik dashi which is which is just the uh so that's just the singular noun with the uh common singular suffix yod my sanctuary but it could potentially be uh uh, you keep my Sabbaths and venerate uh, the sa the sanctuaries of what would that be then uh, in the construct? I'd be interested to know what uh, what you would see uh, Tirau as, but that's maybe that's something we could talk about on uh on my reading stream but um it's a uh, it's an interesting question though we have a super chat from coral with five i think that might be brazilian real i'm not sure five five oh, something yeah, five, nice. five of some sort of currency apologists like inspiring philosophy love oh, to talk yeah. about how christmas doesn't have pagan roots but in the end does it really matter oh, I see. when yahweh sorry i see what she's getting at. i just need to say this uh so simone is just pointing out that yes it would be a plural if you change the pointing to a patak as to as opposed to a hierarch so yes you're absolutely right so that could just be my sanctuaries again so contrasting your sanctuaries versus my sanctuaries that's very interesting uh, and i'd be keen to see if there's yeah anyways okay sorry 
no problem. Uh, so uh, I we've actually done episodes on why Christmas isn't. Pagan, oh yeah. Uh, which is a common misconception. Um, and the reason we care about it at all is because we're good skeptics and we <laughs> want to do good history. And like, there's plenty of of good arguments you can make. We think against theism. You don't need to make bad ones, you know. Uh, but um, I I think it does. It should breed a little bit of humility when it comes to um, modern Christians understanding like that they weren't handed down. And here I'm thinking of like the, the biblical literalists, the very rigid thinking when, if they could understand they weren't handed down this unchanging tradition from the beginning of time to now. Right. You know? Yep. So yeah. if, if our understanding of the divine could have altered through the millennium, maybe you don't have it all figured out either. I don't know. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, you're you're right about that. Um, and I, so I, uh, I mean, I hate I hate sticking up for for inspiring philosophy, but my suspicion is that he would probably tell you he would probably respond by saying, "Yeah, so like, with the acknowledgement that there's that there is a a cultural debt in the Old Testament that's owed uh, to." to the Canaanites. I think I, I was actually, I was actually just watching a stream of his today where, um, you know, he, he said uh, much the same thing. Of course, there's all sorts of, of, of apologetic, uh, um, apologetic hoops that they, uh, that, that, that get created to, to navigate you through all that to, you know, Yahweh and Jewish culture being the good one. But uh, he would probably just go, yeah. So what? You know, what matters is what what Christianity became. Right. One more question from Simone. Uh, she asked about forty five five, um, and it says, "I am." Yeah, I am, and there is none else beside me. There are no gods. Asking if that may have been should have been taken figuratively, like. Um, I am Yahweh, and there is and there is none else besides me. There are no gods. Um, I I think uh, potentially yes. Uh, Isaiah forty five. There's a couple of texts in Isaiah that are that are tricky in terms of uh, in in terms of how they they really do. I think Isaiah is it Isaiah fourteen. There's another one there that's. Uh, that appears to to be pushing uh, very strongly in the direction of 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 a monotheistic uh, ideal, but it, again, also within some of this this uh, 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 poetical uh, these poetical structures, you know, it, it, it's hard to say is this is this an exaggeration, right? Is this just a way of saying? that all the other gods uh just don't compare to yahweh so much so that they're they're basically nothing um i i think uh i i am interested i am most interested uh I, but very sad now to discover that uh the conference that i mentioned that dan is putting on at brown in may is uh is no longer going to be streamed um live uh, but I, I'm told that they are they're recording the sessions mm -hmm. and publishing them uh, afterwards. The reason for that, uh, as I understand it, is that some of the papers that are being presented are uh, in works for publication, and people don't don't want them widely publicized until That's after, fair. right? So, um, so we'll have to wait and see. But I I'm very keen to see uh, how uh, Dan and the the attendees at uh, at this conference addressed a number of these questions um because i have i have some of the same myself all right well uh we've been going for a little bit over two hours now so um thank you so much for your time you're very generous with your always time, fun as always yes. uh super it, it was it's it's fascinating to be able to peel back the layers of like the sort of things that I was yeah. taught in Sunday school and seeing what was behind it, which, which honestly like, for me is way more interesting than the sort of like, I don't know, 
the ve- the very like homogenous sort of story that oh, worked him in. I, I know, right? I like the idea that like okay, there was one god and everyone worshipped him and everything was fine. The end. And it's like no, they're like the the human culture was a lot more of a tapestry. You know, that's way more yeah. interesting because oh, it makes them yeah. feel more like us, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. I also appreciate that that you do this because it allows me to kind of like feel what it'd be like to be like a true biblical scholar. Like I'm seeing, you know, you know, like you putting the puzzle together and like trying to piece things and like, well, we have this section over here, so it must mean this. And if that's the case, then this would mean that this was changed. You know, like it, it, it's just fascinating to watch uh, it in action. So well, appreciate I appreciate that. Jared. Thank you. Yeah. No, it's, it's good. I like, uh, I like coming here. You guys put on a, a, a very nice show that, uh, that I enjoy. So it's good. Well, Thank you. we'll definitely do it again. Uh, if people in the chat would like to see more of Kip, his uh, links are in the description. The link to that one episode we promise will be in the description at some point in the near future. Check back. Uh, make sure you subscribe to Kip's channel. Particularly, I'm uh, definitely going to go and after this make double sure because I don't think I remember to put the Diablo Critics thing in my watch later list. I'm going to go do that as soon as we're done so that I don't forget it. Yeah. Uh, everyone else should do the same. Um, do you have anything else you want to say before we uh, sign uh, off? I don't think so. I think uh, I, I think that's it. Awesome. Uh, for this channel, if you subscribe, what you'll be seeing in the near future, we're going to be doing a discussion next week on Galatians and the whole like brothers of the Lord thing. Hopefully we can set, settle that forever. Uh, <laughs> when are you doing that? Uh, I, I believe we're supposed to be doing that next Tuesday oh, uh, with Chrissy Hansen, I think. Uh, oh, plan. yeah. Uh, so she's going to be talking to us about her work with that. Uh, moving past that, we've got some more in our Shroud of Turin radio carbon dating series that we're going to be doing. And I think, hopefully, we, we haven't nailed down the time yet, but I think we're also going to be having um, a Christian cosmologist come on, uh, Jess Waring, who's a really cool guy. Oh, oh uh, cool. Talking about the origins of the universe. And I, I always like bringing on people nice. that um, have a different perspective, um, you know, so that we, because uh, that's, if, if you're wrong or if, you know, someone's going to challenge your ideas, you're going to find it from someone who disagrees with you, right? So, um, but anyway, uh, Nitty says, uh, we don't want a uh, GE target on my back. Uh, don't worry, GE already. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so, sure, I'm sure it's, it's already there. Uh, yes, uh, already there. All right. But, uh, uh, anyway, thanks again, Kip, for uh, coming on. Really appreciate it. Um, uh, I'll make sure that link, uh, YouTube will filter out links, but I'll get it into the chat. Um, okay. I just put so it in the, the private chat too. Uh, make sure you subscribe to both our channels so you don't miss anything that's coming up. But until next time, remember, you've always got reason to doubt. Peace out.